Well, good afternoon, and uh, I apologize for that long bio. The one thing I do want to tell you about myself that you're probably not aware is that uh, I am actually from St. John's, Newfoundland. And I'm just wondering if there are any other Newfoundlanders here in the crowd other than me. Yes. Yes. We're probably cousins. <laughs> you know, one of my cousins, he was driving an empty U-Haul truck on the 401 highway just outside of Toronto. And he came across a broken down truck. So we all be, all being the nice guy he is, he stops and he pulls up to the trucker and he says, can I help you? And the trucker says, absolutely. In the back of my truck I have 12 penguins and I have to get them to the zoo. So the new says, hey, no problem. I can take them to the zoo for you. And the truck driver says, I'll pay you $500 if you take them to the zoo. So they load the penguins into the Newfoundlander's truck and off he goes. Well, the next day, the truck driver is walking down Young Street in Toronto and he sees the Newfoundlander with 12 penguins in tow hanging onto a rope. Now this truck driver's mad and he yells at the Newfoundlander. He says, hey, I gave you $500 to take those penguins to the zoo. And the Newfoundlander says, relax. I took them to the zoo and there's still money left over. Now I'm taking them to a movie. <laughs> you see, your last two days in leadership discussions and exploration, one of the key elements is about communications, isn't it? It's all about communications. So as I share with you my journey of discovery throughout my years of policing, I want you to connect to your journey, where you've come from and where you're at and where you're going. I'm asking you to, to take your journal and to write down those nuggets that I may be able to share with you, or if I connect a dot, or if some type of spark ignites and you say, yeah, yeah, I want to write that down. I want you to think about what you're doing well right now as a leader and what you can be doing more efficiently and effectively for yourself, for your colleagues, for your team, for those that you report to. We call them SMART goals and the acronym for SMART is about being strategic and measurable, achievable, right, realistic and having a time limit. So what could be a SMART goal? Well, I'm going to tell you, it might, you might say, I want to meet with five of my direct reports in the next two months for coffee, half hour coffee, where I'm just going to shut up and truly listen to them and ask them what's going on and what do they think. That would be a SMART goal. And I'll share with you a number of journeys and experiences and stories around listening to your people. Now I have a definition of leadership and management which I'd like to start up front and share with you. The reason being is, is because I think it really puts the rest of the presentation into perspective. I believe that you manage things and you lead people. You may want to write that one down because you're both managers and leaders. You manage things, you lead people. And during the industrial revolution, of management, what seemed to be the norm was that we did manage things. We managed production lines and money, accounting, processes, audits, investigations. But we also managed people. We were treating people like things. And in the new knowledge worker age that we're now engaged in, whether we like it or not, you cannot treat people like things. That requires leadership. You lead people. Different skill set. Different mindset, skill set, and tool set than management. So depending on where you're at right now, you may be both a manager and a leader. And you may be doing more managing than leading. Like if you're an accountant and you're truly spending most of your time and energy on the books, you're expected to be a manager and to be micromanaging and watching, paying attention and using all those management functions and techniques. But then when you change to if you have some reports or you work with people, you sure don't want to treat them like a thing. You manage things, you lead, lead people. And I want you to think about that as I talk about my journey and I ask you to, to really explore your journey because that really, really helps separate where we're going to go as we talk about leadership. And it's great to be around so many leaders. I'm preaching to the converted. 
which is great. And I just want to start with the whole notion of the paradigm shift. You see, if you want to make small changes in your behavior, right? if you want to make small changes, you work on your behavior. If you want to make significant changes, you work on your paradigm. Here was my paradigm with the RCMP. I joined out of Nanaimo, British Columbia. Actually, I had finished uh, college in Victoria. And I was recruited to the RCMP. And where do all of us go, men and women, when we go to boot camp? But Regina, Saskatchewan. So you got to see this beautiful summer day. I roll up in my old pickup truck to the academy. It's called Depo, the RCMP Training Academy. Throw my pack sack on my shoulder, walk onto the grounds of the academy, where everywhere I look, I see men and women marching or running in unison down the roads. I'm trying to find out where I check in. So I've got my hands in my pocket, my pack sack on my back, and I'm walking down the sidewalk. And up ahead of me on a perch, I see, well, it wasn't a peacock, but it was a, a Mountie who was in his uniform, dress uniform, with the traditional stick that you'd use if you were marching in the military, standing up at attention. So I walk up to him and I say, excuse me, sir, I'm a new constable here and I'm looking to where I should check in. And he looks at me and he says, what is your name, constable? And I go, well, my name is Ward, what's yours? Well, he loses it. He says, what are you doing walking on my sidewalk with your hands in your pocket? And uh, by the way, my name is not Sir. I work for a living. I'm the Sergeant Major. Right now, give me 10. So I pull out my wallet. I'm sitting there, right? I am, I'm petrified because this guy's just going mental on me. And as I'm trying to find 10 bucks, which is like all my savings, he starts going into, are you trying to bribe a police officer? <laughs> And I'm thinking, oh, he means 10 push-ups. And now I'm done, right? He starts to discontinue to lay into me about how the academy never walk on the sidewalk and you never walk with your hands in your pocket. Welcome to the RCMP Boot Camp Academy, Regina, Saskatchewan. My paradigm, where are they taught us? The right way, the wrong way, and the RCMP way. I was a little confused, but... When I was ready to leave the academy, I was definitely trained as a law enforcement officer. My par paradigm, our paradigm as police, were around, was around law enforcement. The real tool that we were given in our toolkit at that time to deal with society's problems was law enforcement, pulling out the law book and figuring out what law was broken and how we should apply that law or those laws through investigation and through then bringing a charge up through the judicial system. Not wrong, but today we would say incomplete. So I want you to think about right now where you're at in your organization, in your department, in your unit, your paradigm, where are you at? And I'm not suggesting it's wrong. It may be perfectly aligned for where you need to go in the future. It may be just incomplete. It's definitely something I woke up to years later in policing, and we in the RCMP recognized. Fast forward, we recognized we were problem solvers. We were the social doctors of community, because we were the only ones out 24-7. Not wrong. We were just incomplete with the law enforcement. Anyways, the story goes like this. Back then in the RCMP, you could pick anywhere you wanted to go for your posting, except your home province. And the idea behind that was is that back then, there was a worry that you might get influenced by your friends and family if you went back home or even to your home province. So you, could, you weren't able to be transferred back to your home province back then. That's changed since. But back then, that was the reality. So I'm a skier, right? Like I actually wanted to be a, a professional hang gliding and ski bump before I joined the RCMP, but I didn't see a future in that. So thinking about where I'd like to go, and I love skiing, Rocky Mountains. I came up with the brilliant idea where I put forward and reformed to a request to the RCMP for us at the uh, academy. I would like to go to Lake Louise, Alberta. It was my first posting. Well, I got a lake all right. When my posting came out, it was Lac La Biche, Alberta. <laughs> where the heck is Lac La Biche, Alberta? Well, the 31 other men that I trained with for the six months they were howling at my posting. 
One of them happened to be from Alberta. So he brings out the Alberta map and rolls it up, out. And at the very top of the map, there's an arrow that says Talak Labish <laughs> and Fort McMurray. It wasn't even on the map. So I jump in my pickup truck, my pack sack, and oh, I got a trunk now full of a bunch of uniform gear, and off I go to Lac La Biche, Alberta. Well, you have to know that Lac La Biche at that time in the 80s was known as the most violent town in Canada per capita. They bragged about the fact they were the most violent town. They took the town drunk, had a photograph image put on a t-shirt with the fists up, and it said, welcome to Lac La Biche, the most violent town in Canada. So I show up there, greener than green. Of course, you work under a recruit field trainer. And my recruit field trainer says, welcome to the war zone, and I'm going to teach you all about policing. Rule number one, we go out on a night shift. He says, I'm going to show you crime prevention. So we're driving these big suburban four-wheel drive trucks. He opens up the back doors of the suburban, backs the suburban up the front doors of the local Lac La Biche tavern, at bar closing time, you can't get out of the tavern without getting into the back of the suburban. Everybody was arrested. He said, this is crime prevention because we don't get them now. We're going to get calls later on when they're drunk and they're fighting. Well, one guy gets in the back of the suburban unwillingly and he says, I'm not drunk, I wasn't drinking. And one of the other possible said, too bad. Unbelievable. But that was the reality, that was the paradigm. Think about it. So here I am from Nanaimo and Victoria to Lac La Biche. Well, one of the things that happens is after a few months of recruit field training, they give you the keys to the car and they say, go forth, young woman, young man, you're on your own. You're now able to do your job without having your training wheels on. I remember one of my first calls for service. It was to the crime of road hockey in progress. <laughs> Edmonton Dispatch calls up and says that kids were playing hockey on the road and they had blocked it off. So I was pretty excited. Finally, I get to go to a call on my own. So now you've got to see this, you've got to picture this. I'm in the fancy blue and white police car. Now, in that car is a big gaping hole in the dash because they had taken out the air conditioning and the AM, FM radio of these new cars at Post Garage out of Edmonton because at that time they didn't want us to be too comfortable or to be listening to the radio while we were working. So I had gone and bought one of the biggest boom boxes known to mankind, seat belted it to the passenger seat of the police car, rolled down the windows of this car, and off I went, lights and siren, to the first crime that I got to go to on my own. As I come up to the crime in progress where the kids are playing hockey, you have to imagine this car, police car coming into a four-wheel drift with the lights and siren still on. I turn off the siren, I leave the rock, rock and roll music blaring. As I get out of the car, put on my official Mountie hat, now these kids are all standing there and they're shaking in their boots as I march up to them. And I go, you guys are busted, I got gotcha. you. <laughs> and they look at me and I said, you know, I got two ways I can go on this. And then I, and I started to, and I had to memorize all the provincial statute crimes or laws that they had broken. I started to, to dictate to them what all the tickets and what all these different offenses they had committed were. And I said, so I can either write you all these tickets or do you got an extra stick? And one of the kids says, pardon? And I go, do you have an extra hockey stick? Are you kidding? And I go, no. Well, we got an extra goalie stick. Now, they were playing hockey, road hockey, but they didn't have goalie on each side. So they give me the goalie stick. So I throw off my official Mountie hat. I have the street blocked off with the police car with the lights still on, the music blaring away. And they put me in net. Now, I don't know if you've ever played road hockey or seen road hockey, but do you know those orange rubber balls that they use? Do you know how they hurt? <laughs> For 20 minutes, the kids were taking slap shot shots at me. It was a one-way game against the cop in net. And they were having a hoot. It wasn't any fun for me. That was before we had bulletproof vests and any other type of protective gear. So I'm taking these shots, and these boys are just having a laugh. And a... But after that, they said, OK, you can come out of the net now. Now you can play with us. 